Jackson Crawford. I'm an Old Norse specialist, previously teaching at many universities, and now uh, working as a sort of full-time public educator, including on my Patreon-supported YouTube channel about Norse language, myth, runes, etc. This is a continuation of my series about the uh, possible origins of the shapes of individual runes in the oldest known stage of the runic alphabet, that is the Elder Futhark. Now, this video is preceded by uh, four or five others. I'm going in roughly alphabetical order in Elder Futhark, although I'm dealing with some letters uh, together that don't come together in alphabetical sequence in Futhark. So today I'm looking at the K rune. And then as I was taking notes for that, I realized that it makes sense to talk with the G rune together with it. And then um, there were enough things there that made me think about the D rune that I thought I might as well just talk about that, even though that comes, depending on which Elder Futhark conscription you're looking at, either last in the alphabet or second to last in the alphabet, whereas the K rune is uh, the sixth. So let's take a look at the K, the G, and the D or Eth rune. So with the K rune, we have actually, uh, although this may not seem like it, a more persuasive argument for Italian, that is to say Etruscan or Roman origin, than with the R rune. Remember when we looked at the R, we saw that there are actually a fair number of variants of the Greek alphabet that have an R or Rho letter that looks like the Roman letter R, so it's not impossible that the, uh, the rune R could come from that. Um, the reason why the K rune shape actually argues pretty persuasively for some Italian origin or Italian mediated origin is that the Greek letter gamma for the G sound often appears in local and archaic alphabets in Greece turned a little bit to the side, so looking more like um, an angulated Roman letter C. The Etruscans in ancient Italy borrowed such a gamma and they usually wrote it as one curved line, so that's the exact origin of our C. Now, the reason that our C in Latin, and in many cases in uh, modern European languages too, stands for a K and not for a G sound, is uh, exactly the Etruscan mediation. So, as I talked about in my second video about the origin of the uh, alphabet writ large with Dr. Luke Gordon, and this video is actually on his channel, Word Safari. The Etruscan language didn't distinguish G from K, or D from T, or B from P, and the Romans borrow an alphabet from them where C can mean K or G. So actually, initially, the Romans who do distinguish C from G, K from G, um, the whole time, are writing uh, in an Etruscan inspired way with just one letter for both. This is actually the same thing Younger Futhark will do for unrelated reasons uh, 1500 years later. And uh, there's still traces in, in Roman writing of a time when the letter C was also used for the gus sound. For example, the way that the name Gaius is uh, abbreviated as C rather than G, which uh, my good friend Luke Ranieri has discussed on his channel a little bit. So, long story short, the use of a letter that looks like a C to mean a K sound rather than a voiced G sound is a strong sign of Italian derivation of this letter. Whether from the Etruscans, from the Romans, or from some other group, maybe, for example, in the Alps, that borrowed their alphabet from the Etruscans. It is interesting to note that in most of the ancient Alpine alphabets, like uh, the Medic, there is some kind of independent Greek influence even after they initially learned the alphabet from Etruscan, so that those do wind up uh, adapting gamma with its Greek value of ga, and then kappa with its Greek value of ka. Um, but that is markedly unlike, of course, the Etruscan, Latin, uh, runic, or for that matter, Celtiberian or Lepontic use, where it is the gamma letter that comes to stand for ka, and uh, some other solution is found for representing the G. 
Now the Romans, for the record, uh, what they do is they take that letter C and they add a bar to it to make what we still recognize as letter G, right? Modify it. It's funny because it's originally a gamma. The Etruscans transmitted it as a cu sound. The Romans turn it back into a gu sound by adding something to it rather than just readopting that as the uh, G and adopting the Greek kappa as K. So a little bit odd. Um, I mentioned Lepontic there. I want to make a big point about saying that Lepontic could be the source of this too, the Lepontic uh, alphabet. Uh, alphabet used for writing the Celtic Lepontic language, closely related to Gaulish in the Alps uh, in the uh, first millennium BC, uh, does have that um, C shape for the K. So that could, in fact, be the source for uh, the Elder Futhark uh, K room. I think that's pretty uh, interesting in light of uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit later here with uh, the D room or Eth room. Let me come back and talk about that G and that D uh, then after a quick word from my friends and partners at Grimfrost. <laughs> So what might be going on with the G rune, which looks like an X? One possibility is that this is just a uh, mirrored C uh, placed end to end, which is not impossible, but seems a little strange. What I mean is it's strange relative to how letters are typically uh, adopted and added to alphabets. Um, what, it's, it's notable that in the history of alphabets, people receiving an alphabet from another culture, writing another language, are typically really, really reluctant to get rid of letters. So you see this in, uh, well, Etruscan, which in fact does have kappa and uh, copa, but just uses them as variants of the K sound before different vowels. And of course, ultimately, as I also discussed with Luke Gordon in the video I referred to earlier, uh, that's the reason why we write Q-U, not C-U or K-U for the qua sound, because the Etruscans had this leftover letter copa and they had to use it for something, so it became the ka sound before U. Um, so, you know, I wonder if something like that is happening with runic, because you don't often see uh, the scenario where a letter is borrowed and then modified. Um, it's more likely when uh, you want to add letters to an alphabet that you've adopted from somewhere else that you borrow from a different set, which uh, is, for example, kind of like how in Old English and Old Norse, the rune uh, Thursas, Thornas, Thorn is used to write the, the TH sound. Um, or probably uh, Cyrillic, uh, what's the letter called? Sha, which is from uh, Glagolitic, while the rest of Cyrillic is mostly from the Greek alphabet. Or you sort of very barely modify an existing letter. This would be like ev in Old English and Old Norse writing, where it's just a D that has a slash through it. Or like the Polish letter eu, which is just an L with a slash through it. Or you only very gradually specialize existing variants of one letter for different roles. So, for example, you see that in the history of our letters I and J, which are originally one letter, but the lengthened version comes to being specifically the consonant, or U and V, originally one letter, where the more angular version comes to mean specifically the consonant, but those aren't always uh, the values, but those variants have existed for a long time. So in that case, part of what I wonder is if, you know, this the mirroring thing just doesn't seem like a very plausible explanation for the, the X-shaped G, could it be that chi, the X-shaped letter in Greek, could be a leftover letter when some version of the Greek alphabet or Greek-derived alphabet is borrowed into uh, uh, Proto-Germanic-speaking people's hands and, and turned into the runes? They don't need another letter 
for writing a cuh-like sound because there's not a phonemic difference between unaspirated and aspirated cuh in Proto-Germanic. Um, so they have this letter that's kind of left over, but they don't want to get rid of it. But perhaps because they've borrowed this alphabet through Etruscan, or I think pretty unlikely Roman, or a Lepontic source, where you have that Etruscan use of gamma for cuh. They need a ga, and that leftover chi is a sort of available to fit into the gamma slot. It's also possible that the same leftover thing happened. I think I mentioned this talking about um, the thorn rune with phi. If the uh, doubled thorn on the uh, Illarup Old All Shield Grips 2 and 3 is in fact the original form that could point to it borrowing from phi, phi being a leftover letter used for the th sound that there isn't otherwise a letter for. It's pretty interesting to note that in Venetic, another one of those Alpine alphabets, the chi in its psi looking variant, uh, so it's not the same as the X looking variant that I'm talking about here, is actually used as the gu sound, right? That's kind of cool. Um, it's obviously, I think, not the source for the runic use of a chi looking G, but it is such a close parallel that it suggests that the scenario of uh, Kai being borrowed as the runic ga is well within the realm of plausibility because something very similar happened. And this is why D is included in this video. Something very, very similar is probably what happened with runic D, or rather its progenitor in Lepontic. Now the great Celtic linguist David Stifter has shown that the almost forgotten Greek letter San was one of these leftover letters when the Lepontians, these ancient Celts in the Alps that I mentioned earlier, borrowed the alphabet probably through Etruscan mediation. And not having anything else to do with the San, uh, which is some kind of sibilant sound and from some a letter that was in some kind of Phine some kind of sibilant sound in Phoenician, it's already not necessary in Greek. It drops out of use in Greek, but it's still present in a lot of archaic Greek alphabets and Greek derived alphabets. Um, they don't have anything to do with this, and they've adopted such an Etruscan inspired alphabet that, like the Romans not distinguishing G and K, they also don't distinguish D and T. So they need a letter for D, and having this leftover son, they use it for D, and the form of son that the Lepontians use looks exactly like the Daga's rune, the D rune. So I think that it's hard to believe that this is a coincidence uh, that both Lepontic and runes use this weird son looking D, uh, especially considering the many other parallels between Lepontic and runic writing. So I think that the rune D is almost certainly Lepontic in origin, and the way that it was formed gives us a plausible potential origin for the G rune too. The K rune uh, points only to some kind of Italian or Italian mediated derivation, but that could well be Lepontic as well. So in the course of these videos, I have uh, been leaning real heavily toward Lepontic having something to do with the origin of the rune, something pretty strong, I reckon. Um, I'm not necessarily ready to argue that the runes are directly derived from Lepontic script, however. You know, we have to consider there's many, many possible middle steps here that are missing, that Lepontic script is borrowed from some other script that then runic script is borrowed from, or Lepontic script is borrowed for writing some other Celtic language, and that's what runes are borrowed from. But I do think that on the family tree of runes, uh, that D and plausibly the shapes of many other letters, for example, the K and the R um, and the F and the U, I mean, basically all the letters we've seen so far, could plausibly have a starting point that is very, very close on the alphabet family tree to Lepontic. Of course, Lepontic being this nearly forgotten Celtic language from a long time ago, we have to remember there's a lot of other nearly forgotten or truly forgotten languages from that time or earlier or later. So, uh, we're probably missing some puzzle pieces here, but I have become vastly more persuaded than I was uh, even, say, four years ago that 
um, Lepontic or something really, really, really similar to the Lepontic alphabet is the mediator between the Greek alphabet and runes. But we'll continue to look at this some more as we go through the rest of the alphabet. Maybe something else will convince me. Maybe someone will publish something that'll really blow me away and make me rethink all of this. But that's that's where I'm at right now. And 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 the D rune Dagas is a huge part of that. Well, thank you Patreon for your continued support of these videos through thick and thin, obscure and less obscure, and from. Uh, beautiful thaw in Colorado, and I wish everyone all the best.